This is the second module in our series on seizures and epilepsy. And as you recall from the first module, we delved into the uh, properties of the EEG. In this module, I'd like to cover three main areas. First, the properties of individual neurons during a seizure. Secondly, the factors that can alter the excitability of neurons and neuronal networks. And finally, a initial discussion on the causes of epilepsy. Now, as you recall from the previous module, we ended by taking a look at an EEG that was recorded while a patient was having a seizure. And we observed the fact that during the seizure, there is a, a electrical activity recorded from the EEG that has the properties of very high amplitude or high voltage, as well as synchronization, depicted here by the existence of this spiking-like activity. So now let's, let's try to understand what's going on at, a, at a, a more microscopic level, if you will. Of course, when people observed that the cortex was capable of giving rise to these large amplitude spiking-like uh, activity, it was just a matter of time before scientists were able to take electrodes and actually probe the cortex directly to try to determine what was going on at this deeper level. So let's explore the nature of this high amplitude spiking activity at a deeper level. Well, it was just a matter of time uh, before scientists were able to develop more and more sophisticated recording techniques. For example, extracellular recordings allow one to place an electrode into the region of the cortex shown here and measure the activity of nearby neurons. And this represents the type of activity that was recorded while the experimental preparation was having seizure activity. And as you can see, the cell or nearby cells were giving rise to this high amplitude spiking activity. Well, uh, with time, there was the development of intracellular recording where electrodes were placed directly into the cell and these recordings represent then the activity of an individual neuron that's in a network that's undergoing a seizure. And as you can see, there are these periodic bursts of activity. Well, let's blow up the time scale here a little bit of one of these discharges. And as you can see, each of these discharges actually represent a series or a train of individual bursts of activity. Now, by manipulating the experimental uh, preparation, it was possible to begin to dissect apart what the various molecular or ionic contributions are to this type of electrical discharge. And what was discovered was that first of all, the initiation of this activity began with the release of glutamate acting on a postsynaptic AMPA receptor or glutamate responsive receptor. This leads to the influx of, of uh, calcium which then, because of the changes in uh, the uh, uh, depolarization of the cell, uh, uh, unblocks the NMDA receptor, which is also responsive to glutamate. Um, this then leads to a voltage-dependent calcium channel to open up, uh, which leads to the influx of calcium. And so if you take a look at this wave and depict it in yellow, this wave actually represents a long calcium-mediated depolarization. So there's this envelope of depolarization that's occurring in the cell that's mediated by calcium. As the cell depolarizes, this then leads to the creation of a series of action potentials. So each one of these spikes actually is an action potential or a train. Then uh, with time, a GABA receptor is stimulated and that leads to then relative or the beginning of hyperpolarization and similarly a voltage dependent potassium channel also uh, causes hyperpolarization and you get a return to the baseline. This, this signature of, an, of, of, of a seizure, this activity of an individual neuron that exists within a, a seizure network is referred to as a paroxysmal depolarization shift or PDS. So when you think about seizure activity in, in the cortex and one thinks about what's going on at the individual cellular level, I want you to understand that these individual cells are undergoing a PDS. They are giving off trains of action potentials. And of course, the EEG spike that we saw on the EEG, these don't represent individual action potentials. These are population spikes. These, this is spiking activity that represents the activity of many, many different hundreds and thousands of cells at the same time, but each one of those individual cells 
is undergoing these trains of action potentials. With this information, you now should be able to understand the definition of a seizure. And a seizure is a paroxysmal derangement of cerebral function due to uncontrolled excessive discharges from an aggregate of neurons. So just imagine, here, here, here's a sea of neurons in the cortex. Each one of them is undergoing a PDS. Now they don't necessarily, they're not going to be having the PDS at exactly the same time. But if these are occurring in a relatively constricted time period, you can understand why the EEG would be picking up a relative population spike of all these cells occurring at the same time. So the key thing about a seizure is that there is both hyperexcitability, that is these PDSs with trains of action potentials, and hypersynchronization, that is large groups of neurons are firing at relatively the same time. And this, this is really, this is a, as simple as it gets. It's, this is really what happens during a seizure, hyperexcitability and hypersynchronization. All right, so now that we understand what's going on at the network and the cellular level during a seizure, let's consider some of the factors that could cause a network to become hyperexcitable or hypersynchronized, because ultimately at least many forms of seizures are thought to result from an imbalance between excitation and inhibition. So in order to explore this, I want you to think along with me, what are the various factors that can affect the excitability of a neuron or a neuronal network? And to begin this thought experiment, here I've drawn in a just a prototypic neuron, right, with its cell, cell, cell body. Uh, its dendritic tree, and its axon. So just think for a moment. Here's a neuron. Without thinking about any of the other connections in the circuit, just the neuron itself, what are the various characteristics of a neuron that, if altered, could result in increased excitability? What are some of those factors? What are the molecules that exist in a cell? What are the processes that exist in a cell that, if you modulate them in one way or another, would increase excitability. So as you start thinking about this, I, I think you'll find that it's actually fairly easy to come up with just like a giant list of things that could be changed. For example, what if we altered the ion flux through a sodium channel? That made it easier for sodium to flow into the cell. That would result in an increased excitability. Um, what if we decrease the ion flux through the potassium channel? That would have the same thing. What if we place more glutamate receptors uh, in the dendritic uh, tree so that the, re the release of glutamate caused in, uh, a, a, a larger number or, 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 or more excitability as a result of EPSPs and so forth. So there are literally, there are dozens if not hundreds of ways that you could alter the properties of the neuron itself uh, to uh, lead, lead it to be more hyperexcitable. Well, that's just the neuron. What about the neuron sitting within its network? Here's a neighboring neuron. Here's input from interneurons. Uh, here's a neuron with its axon that's synapsing in the proximal dendritic tree of this, of this neuron. How could alterations in the network uh, result in increased excitability of this cell? Well, again, if you just think through this, there are just so many, uh, so many ways this could change. You could alter the, the amount of release of, of uh, of the excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter here at this uh, dendritic synapse. Another example would be uh, modulation of actually the physical location of, of this, um, this axon. For example, if this is an, ex an excitatory interneuron and the axon has moved farther away from the soma, then actually the relative contribution of ex excitation is going to be less if the uh, synaptic contact is more distal from the soma than proximal and so forth. And finally, let's not forget that it's not just neurons that uh, contribute to the excitability of the network. There are also a number of uh, other uh, non-neuronal cells, for example, the astrocyte, which has uh, many properties which control network excitability, such as its uh, uh, modulation of the ionic concentration in the extracellular space, uh, the metabolism uh, and the production of glutamate, uh, depolarization of uh, astrocytes themselves, and so forth. So again, uh, this thought experiment is really meant for you to just think through the, 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 the hundreds and hundreds of different ways that network excitability can be modulated.
So now let's turn to uh, 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 definitions again, and we'll start with epilepsy. So epilepsy is a term that refers to a condition in which a patient has a tendency towards recurrent seizures. So if an individual has an individual, if an individual has a single seizure, that doesn't make the diagnosis of epilepsy. Epilepsy is when a person has a tendency for recurrent seizures. So there's something that's been altered in the person's brain that leads it to uh, have a proclivity towards a recurrence of seizure events. Epileptogenesis is the sequence of events that turns a normal neuronal network into a hyperexcitable network. Now, here's, a, here's just a brief list of the causes of epilepsy, and we'll delve into this a little bit more in a subsequent module, but I just wanted you to get a general look at uh, some of the different causes. So there's brain injury, so traumatic brain injury or uh, a stroke uh, uh, affecting a brain tissue. Tumors can lead to uh, seizures and epilepsy. There are genetic causes of, of epilepsy. There are developmental abnormalities that uh, either occur because of a genetic predisposition or are acquired, typically uh, in utero. Infections can cause uh, seizures and epilepsy, and a whole variety of metabolic derangements can as well. So I'm going to uh, just go through a couple of examples of causes of seizures and epilepsy to emphasize uh, how this can actually occur. So here is the uh, chemical structure of a molecule called domoic acid, or domoate. Now, the reason that domoate is very interesting is that in the 1980s, there was an exposure of a group of, of individuals who were up in, in the region of Prince Edward Island who were eating mussels that turned out to be contaminated by an organism called N. pungens. And, and this particular uh, organism produces this molecule, domoic acid. The molecule turns out to be a poison because the people who ingested this poison developed uh, a coma and encephalopathy, and many of them actually had very, very severe seizures or status epilepticus. Most of the individuals with the more severe intoxication actually died, but a few of them went on to develop long-term seizure disorders or epilepsy. And what's very interesting about this particular intoxication is that domoate happens to be an analog of the molecule glutamate. So we just referred to glutamate. Uh, you'll, you'll remember that glutamate is the most important excitatory amino acid in the brain. And this domoate inge ingestion was essentially an example of glutamate toxicity in humans. And uh, this excitotoxicity caused a injury in, uh, diffusely in the brain, including here in the human hippocampus. And it appeared to have caused damage of neuronal network properties that led to permanent hyperexcitability in the people who went on to develop epilepsy. So here's an example of a, uh, an in intoxication leading to seizures and epilepsy. Just as an aside, there are two other uh, rather dramatic examples of uh, this type of toxicity. Uh, here's a California sea lion. It turns out in 1998, there was a particularly notable uh, uh, algae bloom that contained the same uh, organism I mentioned before, n pungent and domoic acid. And there were about 400 sea lions that uh, developed uh, uh, seizures uh, and encephalopathy, many of which died. Also, um, you may or may not know about uh, the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds, um, which uh, featured this attack by these crazy birds and, and it turns out to be Capitola, California, down near Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, this is actually a real occurrence. I think it happened in the 1960s when these birds were contaminated with, again, the same algae and demoate, and they went crazy with this encephalopathy and, 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 and attacked the town. Here's another example of an alteration in a network leading to epilepsy. Um, these, are, these are slides uh, taken from the rat hippocampus. And just to orient you a bit, um, here's a, a major cell layer called the dentate granule cell layer. Uh, and here's another uh, cell layer, the pyramidal cells. And you can see a whole bunch of other cells here in this region called the hyalus and outside. What I want you to do is look really, really carefully at this upper left versus lower right panel. Can you see any difference between the two? You have to look really carefully. And, and I'll help you. Uh, I'm going to highlight some of the cells in red. And if you now look, you see, see all these cells here? Are they the same number in this region here? No. In fact, it's really difficult to find any of these plump 
larger cells in this region, this region called the hilus. Now the only difference between these two preps is that this is a control rat, and this rat, one week previously, had a 0.25, had a 25 millisecond percussion injury on the surface of the cortex, actually, you know, many, many millimeters away from this. Just a single um, percussion injury um, while it was under uh, anesthesia, and then it recovered, and one week later, this is the difference. So that, that model of traumatic brain injury led to the relative loss of these selectively vulnerable neurons in the hilus. And these animals went on to develop hyperexcitability and seizures. Now, to understand what the network defect may have been in these animals, um, I've drawn this cartoon. So here we have a dentate granule cell uh, shown in red. Here it's sitting in the granule cell layer. And its axon is projecting out towards the pyramidal cell layer over here. And its dendritic tree is going up in this region. And here's input coming from, in this case, it would be the entorhinal cortex, for example, with a positive uh, excitatory synapse at the dendrite, which would, um, uh, if sufficient, would lead to an action potential going out towards CA3. Now, it also in this network is our, our two interneurons. This is an excitatory interneuron that leads to excitation of a neighboring interneuron, which is an inhibitory interneuron. And as you can see, this is an example of feedback inhibition, right? If this cell, the, the granule cell, uh, discharges, it sends the action potential to CA3, but it also excites this excitatory interneuron, which excites this inhibitory interneuron, which then causes relative inhibition of the same cell. This is actually a pattern of network uh, function that's seen throughout the nervous system, um, feedback inhibition. Now, in various forms of injury, including the tra traumatic brain injury that I just showed you, it is, it's, it's been observed that there is this selective vulnerability of certain populations of interneurons. And you can now imagine that if this uh, form of injury leads to a loss of this excitatory interneuron, this would actually lead to a decrease in the inhibition elicited by this inhibitory interneuron, rendering the overall circuit more hyperexcitable. So that's one example of increased excitability. Another thing that happens is with the loss of this interneuron, the axon can actually rewire and grow and make synapses on neighboring excitatory cells. And again, thinking this through, here's an excitatory cell. You ha now have this rewired excitatory synapse that is going to excite neighboring cells, again, rendering the overall excitability of the network increased. So this is just one of many hypotheses. Most of this actually has not been proven to be the actual basis of, uh, of, of network excitability leading to seizures, but it gives you an example of one of the mechanisms of, or a couple of the mechanisms of epileptogenesis. So l let me finish this module with uh, one final example of a cause of seizures and epilepsy, and that is mutations in genes. Um, arguably one of the most exciting uh, aspects of epilepsy research over the last 20 to 25 years has been the discovery of now many, many dozens of, of gene mutations that are the basis of epilepsy in humans. This is just one example of an early finding. This was the discovery of a mutation in a potassium channel that uh, is the basis of a certain syndrome of neonatal human epilepsy. And uh, like many of these early discoveries, these have been based on the, uh, uh, the identification of these uh, large families in which epilepsy clearly runs through the family. You can see the many affected members here. And by sequencing uh, uh, these individuals, uh, these investigators were able to identify a particular five base insertion. Um, if you see uh, this series here, a G, C, 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 T has actually been inserted uh, into this part of the sequence, G, C, 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 T. And this results in a change in the protein coding from tyrosine, aspartate, valine, methionine to cysteine, proline, threonine, threonine, and this turns out to be a stop codon. So now this is a potassium channel subunit that has been truncated and further studies have indicated that this truncation leads to dysfunction of the potassium channel uh, in a way that caused increased excitability.
Um, this potassium channel mutation turns out to be part of a larger class of mutations that have been discovered in epilepsy that have been referred to as channelopathies. And this cartoon just gives an example of the many different ion channels that exist both in the presynaptic and the postsynaptic uh, space and uh, mutations in essentially all of these, the sodium channel presynaptically, uh, the sodium channel uh, postsynaptically, uh, uh, cholinergic receptors in the central nervous system, potassium uh, channels, GABA receptors, and calcium channels. Uh, there are other uh, classes of molecules that are al also affected in various forms of epilepsy, but the channelopathies represent the predominant form. In this module, we've, we've covered uh, the, the nature of individual neurons and network activity during a seizure. We've explored some of the factors that control the excitability of neurons and networks. Uh, and we've talked about some of the causes of epilepsy. So with that as a background, in the next module, we'll talk about the classification of seizures.